to our Wednesday night Bible study for this week. We are going to be continuing our study of Joseph, the life and times of Joseph. We started in chapter 37 last week. I'll give a, a quick apology here for the delay in getting it uploaded. We had some te technological difficulties. Um, but we do want to encourage you, if you're just picking up with us in our second class on Joseph, to go back and watch the first one. We started in chapter 37 of Genesis, and we're picking up in chapter 39 this week of Genesis. I want to just encourage you again, if you have any questions for us at all, feel free to email uh, the church office. I'll put the email at the bottom of your screen, and any questions you have about this text that we're studying today or any other biblical questions, feel free to email them to us, and we'll start with those questions at the beginning of our next class. I want to welcome and thank you, Jim Morgan, for joining us again uh, this week in the study be of Genesis. And we're going to go ahead and dive right into the text here in Genesis chapter 39. Uh, we did say that we're completely skipping 38 last week, but we thought we'd we're mention, back up on that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, <laughs> just a little bit. And mention a couple of things that I think are significant here, kind of important yeah. to uh, Joseph's story. Maybe the reason the why 38 is in there. Yeah. And so let me just mention this without getting into all the details I'm reading through chapter 38. Uh, I'll just say that the integrity of Judah is tested. And it's tested with uh, sexual temptation. And he fails miserably. And he fails miserably. And so in that sense, we're going to see here in chapter 39 that Joseph is going to face a sexual temptation. But he not only rises above it one time, that's all it took Judah was one time and he failed. Mm -hmm. But uh, Joseph, after a continuous exposure to this sexual temptation, continues to rise above uh, to the point that he never actually succumbs to it. Yeah. So I think there's a contrast there in 38 and 39 that's important. Yeah. And again, it sets the context for the world that they're living in. Things that we consider to be really as significant moral issues back then, they're no big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, Judah sees a prostitute, he says, let's go have sex. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it, it's not a big deal. And if it's that way among what we would recognize as God's chosen people, you can imagine what the context is going to be in Egypt because there are gods everywhere. Mm -hmm. And sex is an important part of most of them because that's what attracts a lot of people to these type of religions. Absolutely. And so it, it's, it's a wicked world that Joseph finds himself in, even more so than where he came from. Absolutely. And just to give a little bit of context as we jump into 39, uh, Joseph is moving to, uh, not by his choice obviously, but he's going into Egypt. And uh, we're in about the 15th dynasty, uh, Egyptian dynasty, in the year about somewhere between 1750, 1700 BC, somewhere around there. And so... Uh, we have the pyramids. We have uh, this huge amount of gods in Egypt from uh, the, the god Ptah, uh, uh, the god Tha, the god of learning in the moon. Uh, from Ropoli, we have the god Ray uh, of the sun, all these uh, cosmic gods of the universe and these kind of things. And so very polytheistic culture that Joseph's moving yeah. into the heart of, mm -hmm. uh, including which Pharaoh was considered a god. A god. So he goes from a monotheistic home and a, probably a very rural home living among shepherds to the biggest metropolis on planet Earth and the most polytheistic uh, group of people maybe in the history of civilization. Uh, and so we wanted to, to emphasize that because he's, his God is going to be huge in this story and the way his God provides for him, and it gets noticed by these people who are worshiping all these mm -hmm. other gods. So it's significant. Yeah. And all the way through the Old Testament, there's the idea of God versus the gods. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the deal is that once you get to where Joseph is going to be foretelling or telling the interpretation of these dreams, it's the gods of Egypt can't do it. That's right. And now it's the God of Joseph that is going to do it. And that's going to recur again when you get down to the ten plagues because each of the ten plagues is a challenge to one of the chief Egyptian gods. Mm -hmm. And it, that's going to continue all the way through the Old and the New Testament, the idea of God versus the gods, who's more powerful. And these stories, I'd imagine, you know, are being recalled in a wilderness or even amid, among God's people in the mm -hmm. time of Moses and obviously would have a powerful impact to them. Yeah. 
Uh, and even in the exilic period where God's people go into exile, now you're going to Babylon. Well, mm -hmm. they have all these gods in Babylon. What am I going to do? Do what Joseph did. Do that. Go back to there. Be faithful to God. Keep yeah. working, uh, thriving, and blessing the nation you're a part of. That's what Jeremiah talks about, mm -hmm. right? Uh, build your houses among them. Establish your families. You know, you're going to be here for a while. So yeah, you're, you're not coming home soon. <laughs> but and and the other thing is that when you look at Genesis through Deuteronomy, Moses is writing these not for the people who came out of Egypt. He's writing from the, for the their children who are Correct. going to be going over into the Promised Land. Now those people have probably not been giving a real clear picture of God to their children. They stop mm -hmm. circumcising them. They refuse to repent. They'd rather die than follow God. They're out of covenant with God. Mm -hmm. Moses writes these to say, this is where you came from. This is what you need to know about your culture. And so, yeah, I think that you know these stories are being addressed to them. When you go into the promised land, here's what you need to know about what it means to be God's people. Yeah. So th these, are, these are very, very significant stories. And at the end of Joseph's life, he is going to speak to the fact that God's people are going to be enslaved in Egypt mm -hmm. because he says, you take my bones with you. Mm -hmm. And his bones are, are, evidently they know where they are for 400 years. Yeah. Somebody's keeping them in a box in their house or something because when they leave, it says Moses took them with him. Mm -hmm. And they go through the wilderness with them as well. Uh, so I think that's kind of interesting too. Yeah. Uh, so let's dive into let's dive into thirty nine here. We'll start. Okay, let's let's start at thirty seven, thirty six. Sure, now. go ahead. The key word we hope you underlined it last week. It says, meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. Mm -hmm. Now you know wanted to make sure you notice that because that phrase is going to recur about a half dozen times. Yes, and it's going to be very very important. And thirty nine and forty. 3940, it's just going to be vital to understanding yes. what's going on in this story and your impression of Potiphar. Absolutely. So, okay. Let's go into 39 verse 1. It says, Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had bought him from the Ishmaelites, who had brought him down there. And here's the key, verse 2. The Lord was with Joseph. Now we're going to hear that phrase a whole bunch too. Regardless yeah. of the circumstance that Joseph is in, God is with him. Because if Joseph is with God, then God is with Joseph. That's right. And he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. Now, I want us just to take note of something here. God's with Joseph, and he's successful, but that doesn't change the fact that he's a slave, he's a slave. in someone else's house. Yeah. So when we talk about, you know, our, our Sundays, we've been talking about God providing and those kind of things. And obviously we know that this story is going to culminate in Genesis 50 and verse mm -hmm. 20, that, you know, you intended these things for evil, but God for good. But that doesn't mean that your circumstance is going to be an easy one. Yeah. Now God's with him through it. God's helping him be as prosperous as a slave can be, but it doesn't change the fact that he's in a tough situation. He's a slave. Yeah. And uh, it doesn't mean also that he's not going to be tempted. You know, mm -hmm. Some people seem to get the idea, well, you know, God's with me, so nothing's going to happen. That, No, no, no. If, if God is with you, Satan is going to try to make even more sure that you go away from him. That's right. So he's coming after you. If you're with God, you got a target on your back. That's right. Verse 3 says, his master saw, now this is critical too, his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed. In his hands. Now, I think that's pretty significant. We're talking about Potiphar. We're talking about the captain of the guard, somebody of great significance uh, in the household of Pharaoh and the kingdom of Egypt. And he sees that the Lord is with Joseph. Mm -hmm. And I'm guessing he recognizes that because every it's like Joseph has the Midas touch, right? Yeah. Everything he's doing is successful. Mm -hmm. And it transcends, it seems to me, from Potiphar's perspective, it transcends. Oh, Joseph's just smart, or Joseph just has really good organizational skills. Mm -hmm. He sees something that transcends just normal human ability, and he's like, no, this guy's God is with him. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's pretty significant. Among all the gods of Egypt, he's like, no, this guy's yeah. God's got onto something. And he's not insisting that Joseph has to come over and, you know, take up his gods. Yeah. Because, hey, this is working out pretty well. Mm -hmm. Now, and again, keep that in mind as we move into the story that Joseph is of special interest to Potiphar because everything Joseph does succeeds. Absolutely. That's going to come back. And this is kind of 
an early foreshadowing of Daniel, too. Oh, yeah. And the way that Daniel blesses uh, Babylon. Uh, so this is really significant. Potiphar sees God in Joseph because of his success. Verse 4, so Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him. Uh, now that word is kind of like uh, attended, ministered, served him. Uh, so that's one role he had, but then look at what happens. And he made him overseer, not attendant, but overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. So he, Joseph becomes the guy. Mm -hmm. He's in charge over everything in that house. And from, the t from that time, he made him uh, overseer in his house. And over all he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and field. So I think that phrase is really significant, too, that we see here in verse 5. God blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. Mm -hmm. And God is going to do that uh, kind of continuously. It's, it goes back to the promises at Genesis 12 where he makes a promise to Abraham, I'll bless those who bless you. Yeah. And Potiphar, I know it may not seem this way to us because he's not freeing Joseph or something, but Potiphar's blessing him. He's, he's given him yeah. authority and all these things. And so because of Potiphar's blessing of Joseph, God is fulfilling his promise to Abraham by blessing Potiphar's house, an Egyptian's house of all things. Yeah. And Potiphar's not about to release Joseph. <laughs> no, no. Things are going yeah, a little This is working well. out really well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but for all intents and purposes, I mean, Joseph kind of has a lot of freedom for someone who's a yeah. slave, being in charge of the whole house. Well, we think of slavery in terms of the Southern mm -hmm. experience, and it's not that way in the ancient world because from as far back as we know, there was slavery. And people would actually sell themselves into slavery because it improved their position. Mm -hmm. They would sell their children into slavery because it would mean a better life for them. And so slavery is not this horrible thing. It depends on the country, it depends on the time. But at this time, obviously, a slave is gonna have a pretty fair life. Mm -hmm. uh, everything's gonna be going along pretty well. So don't, don't think of, you know, back in them old cotton fields back home. Uh, this, this is going to be a situation where, as far as Joseph's concerned, I'd rather be free, but this is not a bad life. Yeah, things are going pretty well, especially considering the fact that he has God with him. Yeah. Verse 6, so he left all that he had in Joseph's charge. <laughs> this verse is good. Left all that he had in Joseph's charge, and because of him he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. Yeah. So very much like some of you might be feeling right now in this quarantine, and the biggest question of your day sometimes it feels like is, what are we going to eat next? Mm -hmm. That's that's part of, lunch. That's Potiphar's biggest concern of his day. Now again, we got, we got to wrap our minds around this. Potiphar is not, you know, a, a, a bookkeeper over some small things for Pharaoh. This guy has a huge authoritative, significant role in the country that he lives in, and Joseph is basically doing everything for him mm -hmm. uh, and all he's sitting around worried about is what, what are we what are we going to eat you know that's the hard question he has yeah. in life and there's one thing here that's already brought up it says he's the captain of the guard which means basically he runs the prison system mm -hmm. uh, but it says that Joseph is put in charge of his household mm -hmm. and that's going to be important later on I know we keep pointing to things that are going to happen <laughs> later on but that that's important later on that Potiphar knows everything in my household, but Joseph doesn't have anything to do with his job yet. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to be an important factor when we look at what happens later. Yeah, it's a big transition uh, in the mm -hmm. narrative. Uh, so now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. Now here's where I start to relate to the story. You know, this is, rings true. Hypothetically? Yeah. <laughs> um, but in all seriousness, uh, here in the continuation of verse 6, Every time, and I think this is a true statement, every time someone's physical appearance is mentioned in the biblical text, it's because it plays a significant role mm -hmm. in the story. Um, you know, David, and talking about his appearance, Saul and his appearance, he was a head taller than everyone. And yeah. that's, that matters because he looked kingly. He mm -hmm. looked like, and, and from a human perspective, this guy should be in charge of stuff. I mean, yeah. he's big, he's important, you know, those kind of things. And so in that same way, in this verse... This is significant to the story, that Joseph was handsome in form 
and appearance. It's going to play a critical role in what unfolds. Yeah. In because if you've been ugly and fat, Potiphar's wife would never have noticed him. That may be true, yeah. <laughs> so verse 7, And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph. Uh, this is very similar phraseology to, um, uh, for phrasing, to uh, fixing. You know, it talks about Jesus set his face on Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. That kind of an idea. She, she purposed herself on Joseph. She was fixated on Joseph. We're going to talk about casting her eyes. Yeah. Uh, and said, lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house. Now, <laughs> we keep saying this, but that phrase is going to become significant at the end of the chapter. We want to remember this idea that when Joseph was in charge of something, nobody else had to worry about it mm -hmm. because God was with him. Uh, and he has put everything that he has in my charge. And here's another phrase I think that's significant at the beginning of 9. He is not greater in this house than I am. Now, what do you think that phrase means? He is not greater in this house than I am. That as far as running the house is concerned, Potiphar just walks away to his job in the morning and doesn't worry about it. Mm -hmm. Anything that Joseph does, it's got Potiphar's blessing. Mm -hmm. And... Joseph considers himself an equal to Potiphar. Mm -hmm. you know, he's not greater than I am. He's given me this authority. He treats me or has uh, so, what's the word I want to use? He has so endowed me with authority that mm -hmm. we are equal. Um, so that's a huge blessing is what Joseph is saying. He's made me like he is. Nor has he kept anything back from me except you because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God so I want us to take just a second with that phrase there at the end of 9 because this to me is critical in our understanding of Joseph's character mm -hmm. and Joseph's understanding of this whole circumstance and situation that he's in um, he doesn't want to do this to his master, his master's made him an equal so he sees that as a problem but there's a deeper problem it's not just, I don't want to get in trouble with Potiphar. That would be one level of this, but that's not Joseph's biggest concern. He says, how can I do this great wickedness or this evil and sin, not against Potiphar, but against God? Mm -hmm. Now, this is critical because Judah didn't ask this question no. in chapter 38 when he was tempted uh, to be promiscuous and, and to uh, lie with the cult prostitute uh, or the shrine prostitute. But Joseph has this integrity and he has this perspective that factors in God heavily in his decisions that he makes. Yeah, it's like in the New Testament when we're told, you know, serve your master as the Lord. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. He's, he's going to, he could no more sin against Potiphar than he could against God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the two are combined. The two are combined. So again, you know, sometimes we're not given a lot, but before this phrase about Joseph's relationship with God, um, we know God is obviously with him. He's interpreting these dreams with his family and those kind of things. But mm -hmm. then all we really know, and it's from actually later on, uh, several chapters later, we learn that Joseph is screaming. Uh, his soul is in distress when his brother sell him into slavery. But we don't really learn a lot about Joseph's uh, relationship with God or what that's like. This, So to me, this is one of those critical verses that we see, okay, now he's in this life of slavery but what's his relationship with God like? We know God's blessing him. Well, well here it is. Mm -hmm. Here's the key. When somebody tempts him with evil, he says, whoa, wait a minute. How could I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's pivotal. Yeah, in, in human history, it's almost a given that any time that there is some catastrophe, there's a lot of people going to be drawn back to God. Mm -hmm. uh, Joseph probably didn't have too much thought about his relationship with God. He didn't need to. He was the favored kid. He had, you know, the coat. He had his daddy's trust and, mm -hmm. you know, everything. And now everything is gone and he doesn't have anything left. And we don't know why he decided, okay, I'm going to be the best slave ever. <laughs> but yeah. he also decided the only thing that I can take with me because they kept my coat, you know, everything else they kept, but I can take my faith in God. Mm -hmm. And that just became hugely critical to him, which tells you something about his character. Instead of sinking into despair and anger, he said, now I've got to depend on God. 
And he seems to really make two critical choices. One is he's going to be, like you said, he makes the choice, I'm going to be a worker. I'm going to keep being the best, whatever our situation I go in, I'm going to be the best of whatever that is I can be. Mm-hmm. And two, I'm going to make sure I stay faithful to God. Mm-hmm. Those are the two things he hangs on to. And let's face it, those two principles, again, you look at their exile in Babylon, you look at you know these different situations God finds themselves in, that's what they should have held on to in all those situations, those two yeah. principles. When, you know, if I'm going to be in Babylon, I'm going to be the best servant or, you know. Administrator. Uh, yeah, administrator I can be in Babylon, and I'm going to be faithful to God. Those two things will not change regardless of where I am. Yeah, and one thing you pointed out last week uh, is that when we first meet him, his brothers are out doing the work. He's back home. Yeah, yeah. So it's not like he has a real history here with working hard. Yeah, not, not a real history but of working hard. But he yet. realizes that's all changed. Mm-hmm. And so he holds on to what's important, and it's going to work out real well. Yeah, and I think those same two things are true for us today. You know, we've been kind of displaced or put out of our normal routines mm-hmm. for now. Uh, but the two things we can hold on to is whatever I can do, I'm going to do, and I'm going to continue to be faithful to God. Yeah. Whether I'm in quarantine or this all goes away, whatever happens. So there's some good principles in here for us. Uh, verse 10, and sh- and as she spoke to Joseph now, <laughs> this is big too, day after day, he would not listen to her to lie beside her or to be with her. And I think one of the translations might be the NIV says, or to be near her. Or even be with her. Right. So he doesn't he didn't want to be in her proximity if mm-hmm. he can avoid it. But I think a lot of times because of our, our Sunday school um, version of this that we get with kids, I mean, we forget that this was not a one-time temptation mm-hmm. and then she pulls his coat off and it's all over. No, this is day after day. This is every day of his life this is happening because he's in that house every day and she's in that house every day. And, she and, and you can bet it. she's upping the pressure every oh, time. Oh, man. Yeah. And so this is this is critical. I mean, again, we're talking about, you know, temptation and struggles that we have in life. It's not, we're not just tempted one time, right? And it's like you were talking about earlier. Satan is not, you know, getting easier on Joseph. Mm-hmm. He's amping up the pressure day after day. I mean, he's just, you can kind of picture that same divine counsel that we see in Job. Yeah. Where the accuser goes in and says, hey, you know, you put this hedge around your servant, that's why he's being faithful. Let me get in there and really uh, you know, mess stick with it, it to him, you know, <laughs> and see what we can do. And I just wanted to jump quickly to Second Peter for, for a couple of seconds. Yeah, I thought this was great. Um, because this phrase, day after day, it's used several times in the Bible. But Second Peter uh, really, I think, makes a great connection with our text here uh, in Genesis 39. So I'm gonna I'm jumping to Second Peter chapter two. Uh, let me pick up and I'm just gonna I'm actually gonna pick up in verse four. I think there's enough here, and I'll try and go through it fairly quickly. For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until judgment, if He did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven others, when He brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, so. Bad situation, hard circumstance, but God does not forget the faithful. Verse 6, if by turning cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes as he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued righteous Lot. So bad situation, but he doesn't forget the righteous. Now let's look at what Lot is actually being distressed by. And this is where the connection starts. Greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of of the wicked. You think Joseph can relate to that a little bit? I think so. And here's verse 8. For as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Man. Ding. That's Joseph's <laughs> brain right there. I mean, it's like boom. I mean, it just resonates day after day, right? And he's being tormented. as He's trying to be righteous and do the right. No, I'm not going to do that. Why would I sin against God? I'm not going to participate in this, you know, sensual conduct that you have and, and giving yourself over to licentiousness. And yet, day after day, as his soul's being tormented by what he sees and hears. But here's, here's verse 9, and then we'll jump back to Genesis 39. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, especially those who indulge in the lust of defi- uh, defiling passion. So the Lord knows how to rescue the godly 
from trials. Mm -hmm. And man, if that and is that not... last part from sensual... Yeah, yeah, that's right. Defiling passion, from defiling passion, mm -hmm. especially those who indulge yeah. in that. And remember, there's a real possibility Joseph knows that story because that's his family history. That's what, great-grandfather or great-uncle, mm -hmm. whatever. So, you know, there's a possibility that that's one of the things on the way to Egypt he's thinking about, you know, th this is going to be bad, but, you know great granddaddy lot or whatever, you know, great uncle lot. I, I think I can do what he did. Mm -hmm. So, and possibility. That story, that's the story with Judah in 38 is kind of reminiscent of some things that happened yeah, in that, Lot's life too. Yeah. So yeah. I think maybe you're right. Maybe there's a connection there. But I just think that for encouragement for us and a connection to the New Testament, that passage from Second Peter 2 is just like... It's an echo. You can't, you can't miss the connection between no. these two things. And the idea that they're exposed day after day. Mm -hmm. uh, let's jump to verse 11. But one day, when he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house was there in the house. Now, I've seen some interesting comments on this verse, like, well, Joseph should have known there's no one else in the house. I shouldn't be in there. I don't think we can put that on Joseph. Mm -mm. I mean, first of all, it doesn't say it was like Joseph went in there knowing there was no one else. He could have gone in there and she chases all the servants out yeah. and put them in that circumstance. That's what I've always assumed. Yeah. And, I mean, he's trying to do his job. He can't just say, well, I'm not going to go in there and do my job because now Potiphar is going to get upset because he's, you know, yeah. he's in a tough situation. And I think she sets him up. I think. Oh, interestingly enough, she figures her ego, I suspect, is such that she cannot imagine why he's not wanting to go to bed oh, with her. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so she figures it must be because he's afraid Potiphar will find out. So she gets rid of all of them and says, now, you don't have to worry about it. Let's go. Now you're a man without excuse. Yeah. Right? And so, and that's the reason why, after this story, it comes to her, he really doesn't want me. Mm. And she's not going to allow that to go unchallenged. And you can imagine when you talk about her ego and those things, day after day he's rejecting her. Mm. And he won't even go near her. You know, and so you can imagine she's... But she's got to she's, she's got, got an figure excuse. Out how to do this. Yeah. Because well, he's just afraid of what Potiphar would do. That's right. Tattle. 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 Yeah. And he well, knows. That sound familiar? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Joseph knows all about tattletales. Uh, verse twelve. She caught him by his garment, saying, "Lie with me." But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. There's a a good uh, literal application of flee from evil, mm -hmm. right? Uh, pretty, pretty two, two ways to deal with it. Don't even be with her. Don't even be around her. Don't be around sin. And when you're something all of a sudden attacks you, run. Yeah. Two and good ways to handle sin. He doesn't try and talk her down. He he just I'm out of here. So that's it. To the point that he just leaves his coat behind. I don't even care. Yeah. I'm just out of here, right? And again, by the way, notice that every time that a coat occurs, something bad's about to happen. Yeah. Yeah. The, the coat plays a significant role as we move through the story of Joseph. Uh, verse 13, and as soon as she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and fl had fled out of the house, she called the men of the household. Now, I think it's worth mentioning, and you were just hitting on this, she now is going to give up on actually getting to do something with her because she realizes she took every excuse away and he still wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. So that's why she chooses now to throw him under the bus where it's before she was going to keep trying, right? Now mm -hmm. she knows... Even with every excuse gone, this guy's just not going to do what I want, mm -hmm. right? He cares too much about this God of his to, to do what I want him to do. Uh, he fled out of the house. She called the men of her household and said to them, now this is important too. So now she calls everybody back in, right? And now she's going to recruit support for her version of this tale that she's going to tell before Potiphar actually gets home. Yeah. So it's not She got rid of them before so they wouldn't tell. Now she brings them back in so that they will. And she's going to write the narrative. Oh, uh, yes. She's got some fake news going on here, right? There you go. Uh, see, he, now, this is good. we got to notice what she's doing here. She's talking to the men of her house. Here's what she says. See, he has brought. So who's she blaming this on? Who's, whose problem is this that's happening? First thing she does is she blames Potiphar for this. Potiphar is the one that brought this guy in here. So first she shifts the blame to Potiphar. See, he has brought among us a Hebrew to lay the race us. card <laughs> and this is very significant that she calls Joseph a Hebrew right he's not one of us he's one of those dirty no good Hebrews and we have to remember the contention that exists between Egyptians and Hebrews and the more I thought about this this goes back this contention goes all the way back to Abraham mm -hmm. and Sarah because Hagar was Egyptian 
And when Hagar and Ishmael leave uh, in chapter 21 of Genesis, uh, they leave, you know, Sarah says to Abraham, you have to send them out, and Abraham doesn't want to do it. And Sarah says, God told me to tell you to do this, and God backs her up and says, yeah, you need to do it. Um, but they go from the bosom of Abraham, you know, under his cover or whatever, his protection, and they go to Egypt, and Hagar makes sure that Ishmael takes an Egyptian wife. And if you remember going back to Genesis 21, what caused that huge rift between Sarah and Hagar is Hagar was with Abraham and she was laughing. And Sarah was not a fan of that at the beginning mm -hmm. of chapter 21. So we have laughing, an Egyptian, a Hebrew, all those things going back to 21. And then if you go a little bit ahead in the story in chapter 43 of Genesis and verse 32, we read that the Egyptians wouldn't eat with the Hebrews because it was an abomination to eat with the Hebrews. And they go a little further than that in 46. And Joseph tells his brothers, tell Pharaoh your shepherds because the Egyptians think it's an abomination mm -hmm. to have you among them. So we talk about a little bit of tension between Hebrews and Egyptians. We almost lose that because Joseph is so blessed among the Egyptians. But it's there. Oh, yeah. So when she says he's a Hebrew, we got to think, we're thinking abomination level yeah. tension. It's, it's the race card. It's the race card. So... First she blames her husband, then she throws out the race card to Joseph and calls him a Hebrew. And thirdly, she talks about not that he was going to laugh at her, but he was going to laugh at us. He was insulting our whole house. He's insulting all of us. So she's really digging her teeth into the story that she's telling oh, yeah. about Joseph, right? Uh, he she doesn't just want him punished. She wants him dead. She wants him dead. Absolutely. He came in to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. That's really interesting because nobody heard you, but remember, she sent them all out. Uh, and as soon as he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried out, he left his garment beside me and fled and got out of the house. Uh, then she laid up his garment by her until his master came home. Now, I don't know if this is significant at all, but is it just me, or does it seem like it should have said, then she laid up his garment until her husband got home? Maybe that's indicative of something of their relationship. That yeah. <laughs> well, later on, I think we're going to find out. It's not uh, Ozzy and Harriet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's some, there's some issues going on here. Um, verse 17, and she told him the same story, saying, now again, notice what she's throwing out here. She doesn't say Joseph or the servant. She's specific in verse 17. She told him the same story, saying the Hebrew servant, that abomination, that foreigner, that person who's not one of us, playing that race car, whom you have brought among us. This takes me back to earlier in Genesis when everybody seems to be pointing, the woman who you gave me, gave mm. you this fruit, playing the blame game, right? You brought him among us, came in to laugh at me. But as soon as I lifted up my voice and cried, he left his garment beside me and fled out of the house. So, uh, again, there's some... Significant discussion that's unfolding here. Very quickly, I'll just mention that laugh in the Hebrew seems to have more than one connotation. Um, there's a story about Abimelech. I think it's Abimelech. Uh, see the king of the Philistines? I'm trying to remember now. I think it's back in uh, Genesis 26 where Isaac and Rebekah, he hides that Rebekah is his wife. Mm -hmm. And then it says Abimelech saw Isaac laughing with Rebekah. And that's what made him know that, hey, it's... you're married. So I don't think it's because, you know, only wives laugh at husbands' jokes. And so he saw her <laughs> laughing at Isaac. You know, there seems to be a connotation here with this idea of laughing. It can be like a mocking kind of thing, but it can also be like a playful kind of thing, like flirting or something along those lines. Um, just in case people are thinking, that's weird that she said, you know, he came to laugh at, you know, with me or at me. And that's, you know, what does that have to do with what she was really getting after? And I think there's a dual meaning to that word, so I wanted to throw that in there. Um, so let's jump to 19. You want to pick up at 19? Okay, when his master heard the story, his wife told him, saying, this is how your slave treated me, he burned with anger. Now, I think, I think we need to stop there and play a what-if game. Okay. okay? Uh, if you were Potiphar, and you had trusted this slave with everything in your house, and you treated him well, and everything's going well, and your wife comes in and says, your slave tried to rape me. What do you think you would do? I'd probably 
remove his head from his shoulder. Yeah, I, I would revoke his breathing privileges, whatever, uh, because there, there's, if he believes her, there's no way in the world Joseph is going to live through this story. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, most people would agree with that. Sure. And it says he burned with anger, but a question would be, as you said before we started, who's he mad at? Mm -hmm. And I think the evidence is there that he's not mad at Joseph, he's angry with his wife. Yes. I get the feeling this is not the first time this has happened. That's from her um, pursuing it the way that she does, yeah. to his reaction to it, I think tells us this is not the first time we've this had This is not the first time, this. yeah. And so uh, she is about to cost him, because of her lust and her ego, she is about to cost him the best slave he's ever heard of anywhere. Mm -hmm. And somebody's going to have to start doing that work again. Mm -hmm. I think he is angry with her, and I think that dictates what he's about to do, because this is the reason why it was important to notice a few minutes ago that Joseph is in charge of the household. Well, Potiphar's got two, job, two things. One is his household, the other is his job. Now, Joseph obviously cannot continue in the household anymore for his own safety. Mm -hmm. But I think it's interesting, verse 20, Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. I think he takes him out of the house and puts him at his job. <laughs> yeah, me too. And then it goes on to say, uh, but while Joseph was there in the prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness, granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison. He was made responsible for all that was done there. And the warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. Boy, that sounds familiar. Yeah, from earlier on, that there yeah. was no concern. So I think that Potiphar knows exactly what kind of woman he's married to. He's not going to allow her to get away with this. So he removes Joseph from the house and puts him in his job, his work, yes. so that Joseph can continue to bless him. And we had to recognize, you know, because some people might say, well, if he if he really didn't believe his wife or whatever, then how come he puts him in, goes ahead and puts him in prison? We got to recognize that prison in the ancient world was not the place you go to serve a twenty year sentence. Mm -mm. Prison was you're going to go sit in there, and then we're going to have a trial, and then you're either going to be dead or you're, you're going to be sent. You know, mm -hmm. there was going to be a judgment, and it was either death or you can go free. Execution or exoneration. Which will show up with the baker and the butler. That's right. There's no lifetime prison sentence, any of that nonsense. Yeah. He's that's not nonsense. being made a trustee. That's right. <laughs> so when Potiphar puts him in prison, that's an act of compassion. I mean, Potiphar could have killed him like this, and nobody mm -hmm. would have batted him. It's his slave. He can yeah. do whatever he wants with him. So you're exactly right. I think it's an act of compassion and uh, it's kind of a shrewd action on Potiphar's part. Well, if I can't bless my house anymore, yeah. he can bless my job. I think Potiphar's a lot smarter than people give him yeah, credit for. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, the other thing is Joseph is now safe from the wife. God has taken care of him. But it just seems like that Potiphar is going to find a way to use Joseph. Mm -hmm. And if you wonder, well, why didn't he just get rid of his wife? Well, he's pretty high up in the government. You don't want scandals. Yeah. Uh, you know, and if his wife has some kind of political connections, then it might not be expedient to get rid of her, but he's going to let her know, I know exactly what you are. <laughs> yeah. And every day that he comes home and tells, you know, that Joseph, he's, <laughs> she knows exactly what he but he both of them, I'm probably more so her than him, but she must have gotten worried when he gets to be number two in all oh, of yeah. Egypt. She must have been <laughs> I've wondering. Always, I've always thought that would be the great revenge. Yeah. Moses, or sorry, Moses, yeah. Uh, Joseph is a man of great forgiveness yeah. because he doesn't go back and kill her. He doesn't mm -hmm. kill his brothers when they show up. He yeah. doesn't kill the guy who forgot about him for two years. Mm -hmm. He doesn't take any revenge whatsoever even though he easily could, right? Yeah. Uh, so I think that's pretty significant as well in terms of looking at who Joseph was and what was what yeah. mattered to him. And the other thing, you know, we've been telling you all along, watch for that phrase, the captain of the guard, because mm -hmm. that's who Potiphar was. And going over to chapter 41 for just a minute, uh, verse 9, the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, today I'm reminded of my shortcomings. Pharaoh was once angry with his servants, and he imprisoned me and the chief baker in the house of the captain of the guard. Mm -hmm. Verse 12, now a young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. Mm -hmm. So maybe there was another captain of the guard, maybe it's just a title, but as many times as that's repeated, 
Potiphar is the captain of the guard. Potiphar is the captain of the guard. I don't think all of a sudden the story is going to change. Right. I think it's an indication that Potiphar still has Joseph because he recognizes the blessings that come. And Potiphar is a lot smarter than people give him credit for. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that in this case, again, all of the evidence is Potiphar knows what his wife is. Yes. He takes Joseph out to protect him. And Joseph is continued to be blessed because he's still working for Potiphar, the same man. Yes. And, I mean, again, you can't miss in 23, whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. And the, the warden, the captain of the guard, the, the keeper of the prison paid no attention. Mm -hmm. Just like Potiphar, he dropped into 40. You see that captain of the guard phrase in verse 3, but then in verse 4, the captain of the guard appointed Joseph to be with them and he attended them. And mm -hmm. we're back to that phrase, attended, overseer and attending. Just yeah. back to the same phrases, the same words, everything's the same as it was in Potiphar's house. Yeah. So I think the the preponderance I, of evidence is in favor of this being Potiphar who puts Joseph to work. And, yeah. You know, um, even though it doesn't explicitly say that, I think that title is continued for the purpose of connecting yeah. 39 and 40. When it's repeated that often, there's some kind of significance. And remember, the chapters and the verses... We're not in the original text. No. So just because it shifts to 40, we shouldn't think in terms of, yeah. oh, there's new people now. You know, it's a continuation of the same narrative. Yeah. So this, this isn't a case where Joseph has now lost everything. Mm -hmm. Now, Joseph continues to be successful even more so because now he's out of the household and he's into the political system. Mm -hmm. And it's eventually going to lead to him standing in front of Pharaoh and becoming the second most powerful man in all of Egypt. God didn't drop the ball and allow something bad to happen. Joseph did his part, and God took care of him. I will say his status changes. It better to be a servant than a prisoner, right? Yeah. So even though his status drops in terms of maybe the way society would perceive him, mm -hmm. his blessedness doesn't change. He's yeah. still blessed in that same in that same way. And it, uh, just to back up to twenty one real quick, when it talks about God being with him again, the three things it says is God was with. Joseph, God showed Joseph, and God gave Joseph. So mm -hmm. three things God does. Uh, we look there in 21. The Lord was with him. He showed him his steadfast love, meaning, uh, you know, we, we sing that song, the steadfast love of the Lord never, never ceases. ceases. His mercy never comes mm -hmm. to an end. That, that faithful love is what he's talking about. So you're a slave, I'm with you. You're a prisoner, I'm with you. You're the head of Egypt, I'm with you. You, you know, I mean, it doesn't mm -hmm. matter where you are, my steadfast love won't cease. I'm going to yeah. continue to show that to you, and he gives him favor. And so. the important thing for us, God's not going to let Satan win if we do our part. Mm. That's true. Yeah. So we're out of time. Yeah. So we will pick up in chapters 40 and 41 next week. Yes. Uh, we think it's very, very important. We hope we're showing the relevancy of this story, especially to the situation that we're going through. Mm -hmm. God will take care of us. You just keep doing your part. And trust God's going to do his part as well. Amen. See you all next week. So long.